Okay, so welcome everyone to the 73rd lecture of Dr. Hyde's Step 1. Um, <clears throat> we apologize uh, for beginning the lecture a bit late today um, due to some uh, unavoidable circumstances. But uh, from tomorrow, our, our lecture timings are going to be at 9 a.m. and uh, we are going to stick by that. Um, hope you guys are all doing well. Can you guys hear my voice? If you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes on the chat box, please? Okay, good. So uh, were, were you guys able to do the homework yesterday from microbiology, from mycology and bacteriology? Were you guys able to do the homework? Everyone else, were you able to do your homeworks yesterday from bacteriology and mycology? Okay, so what we are going to do right now is we are going to begin with um, the revision. Okay, we are going to begin with the revision, see how everyone stands and um, then we're just going to take it from there. First of all, I just want to revise the fun guys very quick to see if you guys have us uh, study the fungi or not. Okay, so let's begin. First of all, uh, the first question is, um, we have a patient who comes to you with fever, cough, night sweats, and uh, you find a lesion in his or her lungs. And then when you do the microscopy test, you find an organism which is, per which is present inside the macrophage. Um, what organism is this? Okay, good, very good. Okay, uh, you find another organism which is present in a farmer uh, while he was farming. And um, while he was farming, uh, he had, he was struck with a rose thorn and now he has ulcer in the surrounding area and in the draining lymph nodes, he has lymphangitis. What is the shape of the organism under microscopy? What is the shape? Very good. It's sporotrix shenki, cigar shape. Okay, you have another uh, patient who has diabetic ketoacidosis. Now the patient has um, hyperdense lesion on the brain, also on the nose. And what are you going to find on microscopy? What are you going to find on microscopy? non septed hyphae with wide angle branching, indicating that you are dealing with which fungi? indicating that you are dealing with rhizopus. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> you have another uh, patient who comes to you with, um, he has fever, cough, night sweats on, micro on microscopy. You find presence of spherules, which is larger than RBCs. And they're filled with endospores. They're filled with endospores. Which organism is this? Coccidiomycosis, very good. Okay. You have a patient who comes to you from the Great Lakes. The patient has skin lesions, fragile bones, and <clears throat> the patient also has fever, cough, and night sweats. What, what is the organism? The organism is blastomycosis, very, very good. Very good. Then next one. Next one is you have a patient who has hypopigmented lesions on the skin, which is painless. <coughs> and uh, the patient has a habit of not maintaining um, good hygiene. 
And when you do the culture, what are you going to see under microscopy? What are you going to see under the microscopy? Spaghetti and meatball appearance, very good. This is melissa, that is superficial, superficial fungi. Okay. Okay, next one. Next one is uh, you have a patient who comes to you with um, recurrent lung infections, clubbing of the fingers, uh, halitosis. Now the patient has, um, now the patient has, all, the patient also has a history of cystic fibrosis. If you suspect a fungal infection in this patient, what are you going to find under microscopy? If you suspect a fungal infection in this patient, what are you going to find under microscopy? Septate, septate hyphae with narrow angle branching. Okay, septate hyphae with narrow angle branching indicating that this is an aspergillosis, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Okay, how can you diagnose cryptococcus neoformans? How can you diagnose cryptococcus neoformans? Indian ink stain and another one, latex test, okay. Music heartbeat, okay, good. Okay. What is the treatment for cryptococcus neoformans? And this is a very high yield UO question. What is the treatment for cryptococcus neoformans? Amphotericin B with flu cytosin. Amphotericin B with flu cytosin. Okay, flu cytosin and amphotericin B. Okay, so very good. You guys were able to answer most of the uh, questions. You guys were able to answer most of the questions from mycology. Hopefully, you guys will do really well. And uh, thank you so much for doing your homework from mycology. Today, we are going to, we planned on starting virology, but we also have parasitology. So we are going to give you the choice. We can start either one. Um, if, we, if we start virology today, I doubt, how, I doubt if we can finish it on time. But if we start parasitology, we can finish it on time. That's for sure. So what do you guys want to do? Do you guys want to start paras parasitology or virology? Which one? Okay, let me get some feedbacks from you guys and then we will start accordingly. Excuse me. Parasitology. Okay. Okay. Okay, since most of you want to go for parasitology, that's what we will do. We will begin with parasitology. We would finish it. Since we started a lecture, since we started the lecture a bit late today. Uh, hope, um, unfortunately, uh, I, I, I suppose parasitology is the way to go because that will be finishable. And hopefully we can finish vi virology within today and tomorrow together. Okay, so first of all, let's make sure that you guys can see my screen. If you guys can see my screen, can I please get a yes on the chat box? Okay. Okay, so we are going to begin with parasitology. Is everyone ready? Okay. Uh, what was the name of the parasite of the parasitic disease that were that took place in um, a very common immunodeficiency disorder known as selective IgA deficiency? Okay. 
GR diocese. There you go. GR diocese. Okay. Now, parasitic infections. Okay. Parasitic infections can be divided into. Um, it can be divided into protozoal infections. Then it could be divided into nematodes, right? And then it could be it it could be divided into new nematodes, cystodes, and trematodes. Okay. The nematodes, cystodes, and trematodes. First of all, we are going to discuss about protozoal infections. Protozoal selective, not all protozoas are, are high yield. It's only the protozoas which are actively causing clinical infection. And as a and and is and is a cause for concern. So that is protozoal infection. Okay. First of all, the protozoal infection, the infections of the protozoa can happen in the infections of the protozoa can happen in the GI system, meaning that there are protozoas which which infects your gastrointestinal system. Then there are protozoas that infects your CNS. Then there are protozoas that infects your blood, right? And heme for blood. And another one is protozoa. Then, then, then and another one is the protozoas that infect your viscerous. Okay, the, the protozoa that will infect your viscerous. So um, that's the one. So visceral infection. So first of all, we are going to talk about the protozoas that infect the gastrointestinal system, that is the GI system. And for gastrointestinal system, we have three high yield organism that is known as GR diocese and amibiasis and demibiasis and cryptosporidiasis. Okay, so we have GRDA, Lamblia, and amoeba histolytica and cryptosporidium, GRDA, and amoeba, and cryptosporidium. So these are the three. First three protozoas that we want to do or discuss. <clears throat> Let's talk about GR, GRDA first. Okay, GRDA. Okay. GRDA infections are very, very common. GRDA infections over here are very, very common. And there is a very small niche group of people who always gets affected with GRDAs. So GRDAs is, is more very common over here in a small group of people who are who are campers over here? There's there's a small group of people who loves to camp all the time, especially in the summer. Campers, okay. They they find a proper spot in the woods, go over there with their food and drinks and tents, and they camp like there's no tomorrow. And then they come back to the city with GRDA infections. Okay, so that's that. So campers, always remember the word campers for GR diet infections, okay? What happens with GR diocese is that the source of infection over here is fecal oral root, obviously. It's fecal oral root, meaning that um, ingestion of unhygienic food and water is basically the one, or, or, or um, ingestion of uh, water that has been contaminated with animal feces, basically. Okay, so the sign symptoms are that the patients will have, patients will have bloating, right? They will be bloaty. They will have bloaty flatulence, okay? Bloaty flatulence. Then they will have severe, severe foul smelling diarrhea diarrhea okay and the stool will be fatty stools stool will be fatty stools okay and uh, your transmission occurs because um, of ingestion of the cysts in water okay so uh, we'll talk about this the, uh, the uh, for example if you if they have uh, uh, water which was not boiled properly or which was unhygienic or food that was not prepared pro properly, they could still have the cysts, the cysts of GR, GR dia in the food and water and ingestion of those cysts are the cause for the infection. Diagnosis. If we have to diagnose this infection, this diagnosis is done by 
looking at the trophozoids. So this is what I want you to see over here. This is how we, we diagnose this. This stage of GR dye is known as the trophozoid phase, or, or we can also see the cysts. So there are two ways you can diagnose GR diases. First of all, when you, when you uh, do the microscopy of the stool, there are two things which you can see. First of all, it can be diagnosed by looking at the trophozoitic form, okay? It can be diagnosed by looking at the trophozoitic form or it can also it can be diagnosed by looking at the cystic form of GI dye. So if you have to diagnose the trophozoid and the cyst, you have to know the shape and size of the trophozoids and the cyst. The trophozoids, the trophozoids, okay, look like this more or less. Okay, they have one eye, they have two eyes. They're 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 not actually eyes, but okay, that that's how it basically be, basically it looks like like as if the GI dye is wearing a mask with the flagella so that's that that's how the uh that's how the trophozoid form looks and then we have the cystic form the cystic form basically looks like um looks like an egg over here with a with an outer covering and in the middle they have some substance and materials so that's how the cyst looks like that's that treatment is very easy treatment is we treat these patients with metronidazole <clears throat> we, we, treat, we treat these patients with metronidazole, okay? So that is giardiasis, giardiasis, okay? Next one that I want to talk about is ent amoeba histolytica, okay? Ent amoeba histolytica is responsible for causing amoebiasis, parasitic amoebiasis, okay? Ent amoeba histolytica. It's responsible for causing amoebiasis and parasitic de parasitic dysentery, parasitic dysentery. The root of infection, the source of infection is once again, since it's a GI infection, the source of infection is, it's a fecal oral root, <clears throat> fecal oral root. And once again, ingestion of unhygienic food and water is the, is the cause for this infection. And, and the way by which this organism gains entry into the body is in the form of cysts. It's in the form of cysts. So in the form of cysts, they will gain entry into the body, multiply. And then what they would do is, uh, and for the clinical features of these patients, these patients will have bloody diarrhea. These patients, they will have bloody diarrhea. Okay. And these patients will have a very high yield thing, that is, this this uh, organism has a has a tendency to go and uh, stay in the liver and cause damage. So what happens is that the it it, re it releases proteolytic enzymes in the liver, leading to the breakdown of the structures of the liver, followed by neutrophilic inflammation, and this results in a very famous lesion. Liver the liver abscess with a with a pus that looks like anchovy sauce anchovy sauce anchovy sauce is a very brown looking sauce okay uh, that uh, th that is very widely used over here and the liver abscess the pus of the abscess looks like a anchovy sauce so these patients would obviously go complain of right upper quadrant pain right right upper quadrant pain. And since amoebiasis, since this end amoeba histolytica, they have the tendency of releasing proteolytic enzymes. What they do is when they, when they colonize in the liver, they cause the abscess. And when they colonize in the colon, in the colon, what they do is they also release the proteolytic enzymes resulting in ulcers. And the shape of those ulcers are flask shaped, flask, flask shaped, ulcers. Okay, they are flask shaped ulcers. Treatment wise, um, if we have to treat ant amoeba histolytica, okay, ant amoeba histolytica has a very um, important thing that is that when we take the stool of the patient, and when we do the test, the first thing that we would like to see is the trophozoitic form, just like this GR diocese. 
we would like to examine the trophozoitic form of n dimeber histolytica. The trophozoitic form of n dimeber histolytica is very easily detectable because what they do is they engulf your body's RBCs. So this is the trophozoid with all your RBCs or not all, obviously, some of your RBCs inside the trophozoid. So the trophozoids are basically detected with the presence of RBCs inside trophozoid. Previously, there were organisms that were present inside the RBC. For example, plasmodium is a type of organism. But right now, um, the, the, the RBCs are inside the trophozoid. So that's one. Okay, that's, that's one. Another one is Another one is um, you have, you can also visualize the cysts of n histolytica. The cysts of n histolytica, okay, they have nuclei. Nuclei are basically, there are close to two to four nuclei, okay, but two to four nuclei like this. So four nuclei are there for the cysts of n histolytica. But this one, is a very is a much more common presentation so uh this is way more high yield okay treatment wise once again we can treat it with metronidazole okay and uh, another one is there is a type of treatment that i like to remember with the help of a mouse 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 for we prescribe uh for example i would like to think that mouse have mice have a tendency of eating and tamiba histolytica. For example, there's a small parasite and tamiba and mouse can eat them. Mouse for paramomycin. Paramomycin. And, and another one is, there is an iodine-based uh, drug that can also be prescribed that can also help you fight off this infection. This iodine-based um, drug is known as iodoquinone. So that's that. So we have metronidazole, then a mouse that can eat the parasite, so paramomycin, mice, and an iodine-based drug that is iodoquinone. So that is all for entamba histolytica. Next one, next one that I want to go to is a, what is a much more easier drug. I mean, I mean, it's a much more easier bug. Okay, the last one. What is the last organism for GI infections? Fast answers, please. What is the last organism for GI infection? <clears throat> Are you guys still with me? What is the last organism for GI infection? Cryptosporidium, very good. Cryptosporidiasis or cryptosporidium. What type of patients will get affected with cryptosporidium? Fast answers. Very good. Okay. Cryptosporidium is a type of um, GI infection with, an, with a parasite. Okay. Cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium is extremely common in HIV patients. It's extremely common in immunocompromised patients. Patients who are immunocompromised, for example, patients who are suffering from chemotherapy, radiotherapy, um, leukemia, and all of the types of uh, immune destroying, uh, immune destruct destroying conditions. That's the HIV patients and immunocompromised patients. The source of infection is once again fecal oral route. So I'm not, I'm not gonna write that anymore. But the but um, the way in which the organism gains entry into the blood is that the first two organisms they gained entry in the form of cysts. This one will gain entry in the form of oocysts. Okay, this one will gain the entry in the form of oocysts, and um, your uh, this is basically what they will do is they will cause normal uh, watery diarrhea, no, no bloody diarrhea or nothing, okay? But uh, when you try to detect the organism under stool microscopy, you can, uh, you can do an acid fast stain because th th these are acid fast. You can do an acid fast stain and an acid fast stain, you can visualize the oocytes. The, you can visualize the oocysts, okay? And um, the uh, treatment for this one, okay, the treatment for this one is a bit out of the ordinary. It's a, a very unusual drug. The name of the drug is nitazoxanide. Nitazoxanide. 
that is the treatment for that for this one okay so basically with that being said gr das is okay is responsible for causing bloating flatulence foul smelling fatty diarrhea right the transmission is important the way in which it will be kept transmitted and the diagnosis is very important okay multinucleated trophozoites or cysts Keep in mind over here that this is commonly seen in campers and hikers. This is very high yield. The treatment is metronidazole. Entamoeba histolytica. The, your questions are going to come from over here, by the way. Okay, your answers are usually either, either the, di either the uh, diagnosis of the organism or how can you diagnose the organism. Okay, that's that. The questions will also contain uh, this, this information or in certain cases, when they want to make the question a bit difficult, they can also ask you, "What was the what what was the um, what was the um, type of or which stage was the organism in when it got transmitted?" Okay, so that's that. Another one is the amoebiasis. It is responsible for causing parasitic dysentery, so bloody diarrhea, liver abscess, right upper quadrant pain. We talked about this. <clears throat> And then another one is, if we do a histology of the colon biopsy, we can see that there's, that there are flask shaped ulcers. So that's that, okay. When you uh, do um, the, the microscopy, there are basically two things that you can see. Number one is you can see trophozoids with engulfed RBCs like this one. Or another one is you can see cysts with two to four nuclei like this one over here, okay. And for anti what I did not mention is, you can also do antigen testing, which is um, which is another type of test, but this is more diagnostic and confirmatory. Treatment-wise, you have to you can give metronidazole, you can give the mouse paramomycin or R or an iodine-based drug, hydroquinol. That's that. Cryptosporidium is responsible for causing severe diarrhea and AIDS. It has a mild disease, can cause watery diarrhea. The transmission is in the form of wool cysts. And if you have to visualize the organism, you have to visualize the wool cyst and acid fasting. Treatment is with nitazoxanide. That's all you have to focus on. Okay. And you can also prevent this organism by infecting, by filtering the, the city's water supply. So that's, that's that. Okay. Are we clear about the first um, <clears throat> organism? Yes or no? Yes, okay. <clears throat> okay, one second. Uh, don't worry, we will not make you watch the video. I'm just gonna make you watch the pictures, that's all. Because there are some things which you have to remember from toxoplasma. And um, for example, the treatment of toxoplasma sulfadiacine and pyrimethamine. And uh, that's not a very easy thing for everyone to remember, but it's heavily tested. So we just want to make sure that there's a, there's an absolute perfect way we can learn this. One second. And we learned all of this bacteria. We learned all the fungi. Okay. Now. Okay. Toxoplasma gondii. Next one is Nigraria. Nigraria fowleri and trypanosomiasis. Okay. Okay, so the next one, okay, so we are done with the GI. Now we will go to CNS, CNS. So how many systems do parasites affect? Last answers, please. How many systems do they affect? Uh, they affect GI, CNS, heme, and, 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 and another one is GI, CNS, heme, and viscera very good so we're done with the gi one okay let's talk about visceral infection okay let's talk about visceral infection okay okay so not the visceral one my apologies let's talk about cns infections cns infections okay cns cns infection so the cns infections for uh the protozoas are TNT. TNT is 
PNT is Troxoplasma gondii, Nigleria fowleri, and Trypanosoma brutii. Okay, Trypanosoma brutii. Okay, so the first one is Toxoplasma gondi causing toxoplasmosis. A very, very, um, a very common disease, more or less. Not very common from where we are from, but comparatively common over here. Okay, Toxoplasma gondi is a disease which is more common in um, AIDS patient, immunocompromised patient, but having said that, they can also happen in immunocompetent patient, meaning that patients like me and you, who, where we have intact immune system, in, 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 in people like us, the infection can cause what we can say is mononucleosis-like symptoms, mononucleosis. By mononucleosis, we mean fever, lymphadenopathy, weight loss, mononucleosis-like symptoms. So mononucleosis-like symptoms are basically fever, lymphadenopathy, and weight loss. And another one is Toxoplasma gondi is very, very high yield for this disease in AIDS patient where they, where they cause multiple brain abscess that are seen as brain as that are seen as ring enhancing lesions from MRI. So if you do if there's an AIDS patient who lives with a lot with a lot of cats and pets, there's a possibility that these patients are already affected with toxoplasma. And when you do uh, an, an MRI of the skull, you will see that there are multiple lesions like in the brain. For example, this is one lesion, this is another lesion, this is another lesion. These are basically the cysts, cystic growth of toxoplasma in the brain that are seen as multiple ring enhancing lesion. There are some multiple causes of ring enhancing lesions in the brain and toxoplasmosis is number one. Can anyone tell me any other cause of uh, brain, en brain enhancing lesion? Brain enhancing lesion. There's another one that is primary CNS lymphoma. Does anyone know of anything else? Anything else? Which virus is responsible for causing primary CNS lymphoma? HPV. HPV, uh, I, I highly doubt. HPV is the one. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so remember this question. We will. Um, I'm not going to answer this right now. Okay. BK virus is not the virus. Okay. Okay. So remember this question. We this will be about the first virus that we will study when we start studying virology. Okay. So let's focus on this one right now. So toxoplasmosis is uh, is a very high yield cause for multiple brain enhancing ring enhancing lesion in the brain. Okay. And in if the mother is affected with toxoplasmosis during the treatment, the toxoplasmosis can go and affect young children or newly born babies with, a, with what we know as congenital toxoplasmosis. Congenital toxo, toxoplasmosis is also very high yield and the, it has a triad of symptoms. Triad of symptoms. The triad of symptoms is that these patients, they will have, they will have choreo, okay, they will have chorioretinitis, chorioretinitis, they will have hydrocephalus, chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and they will also have intra, they will also have intracranial calcifications. So these three things are known as congenital toxoplasmosis. So if there's a young child, if there's a newly born baby with chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications, these are all, all very indicative for congenital toxoplasmosis. The um, mode of infection over here is fecal oral route, fecal oral transmission. Okay. Fecal oral route and fecal oral route, we have the fecal oral transmission. What happens is that um, cats are, are cat feces, basically, cats and keep their feces. Cat feces is a very uh, good reservoir for uh, the ooze cysts of toxoplasma. Okay, so if a patient lives with a lot of cats and if they do not clean the feces away 
properly, there's a possibility that the oocysts, the oocysts in the cat feces, they can uh, come and infect your food, okay? And you can eat it and then you can have toxoplasma, that's number one. So, and, and another one is, uh, and another one is the meat which you are consuming. If that meat, if that animal uh, also grazed in a field and ate where there has been cat feces in the ground, the cysts could be present in the animal meat. And if you did not cook the animal meat properly, then the cysts can also be the cause of infection. So cysts and oocysts, these are the one. The diagnosis is, is basically, we would like to uh, diagnose and study the microscopy of the CNS fluid. Okay, CNS fluid, where what we can see is we can see tachyzoids. Tachyzoid. So when you do the microscopy of the CNS fluid, because basically what they will do is uh, they are more they are more responsible for causing um, <clears throat> brain um, CNS infections, right? So we will study the CSF over there. If you see a tachyzoid, tachyzoid is basically a C-shaped form of the pro of the protozoa. It's basically, yeah, it's basically a C-shaped form of the protozoa. So that's what you will find, like this one over here. This is a tachyzoid. Okay, this is a tachyzoid. That's what you will see over here. Treatment-wise, there are two drugs that we would we will prescribe for this patient. This is sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine. And that is something that we have to um, keep in mind and memorize. So we will use this picture over here for, um, okay, we will use this picture over here. Okay, yeah, good. So this is a picture mnemonic for uh, Toxoplasma gondi. Okay, look at this, um, look, look at this meth. Meth is a methamphetamine is basically a drug, right? So this meth by this meth that is present over here, close to this pirate lady, okay? You can use this uh, picture to help you remember that um, pyrimethamine is a drug that you get prescribed. Another one is there are some sulfur discs or discs on the ground. I'm not sure if you can see them properly. Wait. Okay, my those are so sulfur dices. Sulfur dices on the ground. Sulfur dices for sulfur diazine. Sulfur dices for sulfur sulfur diazine. Another thing which I want to bring attention to your uh, to you is this whole bubble over here is the bubble that physio uses for a heterophilic antibody test. Okay, so over here, Toxoplasma gondi is known to be negative in terms of heterophil antibody test because the sign symptoms of Toxoplasma gondi that happens in immunoco immunocompetent people is fever and um, mononucleosis. So basically fever and lymphadenopathy. There is another high yield virus that causes fever and lymphadenopathy and that virus is Epstein-Barr virus. And in Epstein-Barr virus, if you have to, it is responsible for causing infectious mononucleosis. But when you do a heterophilic antibody test for Epstein-Barr virus, it's positive. And, but if it's negative, then you can assume that you are dealing with toxoplasma. Okay, are we clear now? Is it clear? Is it clear to what I just said? Okay. Next one. Okay, next one that I want to, okay. okay. So uh, about the treatment of toxoplasma, do you think the picture will help you remember the treatment or not? Yes or no? Because look at this, the, these are cats, okay? These are cat people who, uh, which they used to make you understand that this is toxoplasma. Okay, then it's a story from the Avengers basically. That's Hulk over there. That's, um, I forgot the name of this guy. Um, and um, basically over here, you have the meth for pyrimethamine and you have sulfur dice for sulfur diazine. Thanos, right, right. Thanos, okay, so that's that, okay. Next one, next next one that we wanna talk about is Nigleria fowleri, Nigleria fowleri. One of the most easiest way and the easiest parasite to remember is Nigleria fowleri, fowleri. but with Nigleria, what happens is 
these people, they will die for, for 100% because these, if you're infected with nigleria, this cause, this cause is fatal meningoencephalitis. It's fatal. Okay, the presentation has the word fatal in it, meaning, meaning that if you get affected with nigleria, there is a very high possibility that you cannot fight this off because what happens is nigleria infection, the source infection, the source of infection is uh, people when they get when they go to swimming when they go for swimming in ponds affected with nigleria okay especially freshwater freshwater ponds okay freshwater ponds or freshwater lake where when they go for swimming over there they the nigleria they are already present in the water in form of amoeba in form of amoeba and they gain entry into the body okay they gain entry into the body through the nose and with, through the nose, this organism travels all the way up to the brain via the cribriform plate, and it affects the brain, resulting in encephalitis, and the meninges resulting in meningitis. Altogether, it causes meningoencephalitis, which is fatal. Even though uh, this is fatal, we, we still would have to prescribe a drug to see if it works or not. The drug that we would prescribe over here is amphotericin. Okay, to see if it works, because we never know it might still work at times. So we still have to try as physicians. So we will prescribe amphotericin B. Okay, that's that. Next one. Next one is trypanosomiasis, trypanosoma brutzi. Okay. Let's look at the picture for nigleria. This is the picture for nigleria, swimming in fresh water. Okay, dead victims, right? And amphibians, as you can see over here, amphibians on dead bodies, meaning that the frogs are the amphibians and amphibians on dead bodies are basically amphotericin B. So that's that. Okay, now, trypanosoma. Okay. Let's talk about trypanosomiasis. Trypanosomiasis or trypanosoma brutzi, okay? There is, um, we have to understand what is trypanosoma brutzi and what is trypanosoma cruzi, okay? Trypanosoma bruzi is basically responsible for causing African sleeping sickness. It is responsible for causing sleeping sickness. Uh, what happens over here is that the patients, they have fever, lymphadenopathy, and the reason why it's called a sleeping sickness is because it causes, it's causes severe weakness and the patients can be comatose. The fever, lymphadenopathy, and, and, and comatose patients. Uh, the way that uh, this causes infection is that uh, there's a bug known as a seed, known as a tsetse fly. Tsetse fly, okay. Known as a tsetse fly. I'm not sure. If, okay, let me see if I can show you the bit in the picture. This bug over here, this is known as a CC fly. Okay, if you get bitten by this bug, okay, if you, if you get bitten by this bug, this bug is a very big reservoir for Trypanosoma brutzi. Okay, and um, <clears throat> if this bug bites you, then they will release the organism and they will travel all the way in the blood, all the way up to your up to your uh, up to your brains and meninges. Okay, and then it will cause severe weakness because it will go and affect your brain and you can get comatose because of that. If you want to uh, detect this organism, okay, you, you, can, you have to do a blood smear and in the microscopy, you will find tripo, tripo mastigold, tripo mastigold. Okay. Where did we find tachyzoids? Fast answers, please. Where did we find tachyzoids? Tachyzoids. Okay. Where did we find trophozoids? Where did we find troph trophozoids? Geodiasis. Very good. 
do we also not find trophozoids in, in amoeba? Okay, over here, you have to look out for tripomastic or tachyzoids are C-shaped. Toxoplasma gondii, tachyzoids are C-shaped. Tripomastigot looks something like this. Okay, looks like this one. This weird flail sort of a pipe-like appearance with, with a big flagella like this. This is how a tripomastigot looks like. Tripomastigot. Okay, so basically this is how it will look like. This is a tripomastigon. This is what you see in Trypanosoma bootsy. Okay. Treatment wise, uh, for the treatment is very high yield over here. Treatment is for bloodborne, we can give suramin, suramin, and for CNS, we will give melasopril. We will give melasopril. Okay. Suramin and melasopril. To understand this, we'll look at the picture of trypanosoma. Okay, this is a picture of pneumonia for trypanosomiasis over here. Okay, they are showing Africa, more or less, with uh, African soldiers, showing that it's African sleeping sickness, Bruce Lee for trypanosoma brutsi. Okay, so just 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 remember Bruce Bruce Lee trying to fight off an African soldier is. Trypanosoma brutsi causing African sickness, Afri uh, African sleeping sickness. Over here, tripping goats, the goats are tripping to make you remember that you are dealing with trypomastigote. Okay, so tripping goats for trypomastigote over here. Okay, and and where is, okay, this one. We, we will focus on the treatment over here. As you can see, mellow yellow cans rolling. In this picture, when they were having fun um, drinking and playing games, uh, they tripped over some mellow yellow cans. Okay, mellow yellow cans for melasoprol. The treatment is with melasoprol. Okay, another one is um, another one is one second. Suramin, suramin. Hey, there we go. Syrup man. Okay, this this guy. Okay, this guy, he's, he's carrying a syrup in his hand. So this soldier is carrying a syrup in his hand for sura, syrup for suramin and mellow yellow cans on the floor rolling for melasoprol. Okay, so remember this one. That's all. <clears throat> so that's that. Okay, now let's go back to this one over here. Toxoplasma gondii, let's talk about this first. We talked about this problem in immunocompetent causing mononucleosis-like symptoms. If you are confused whether it's Epstein-Barr virus or toxoplasmosis, you can do a heterophilic antibody test. If it's positive, it's Epstein-Barr virus. If it's negative, it's toxoplasma gondii. Reactivation in AIDS patients who cause multiple brain enhancing, uh, multiple ring enhancing lesions in the brain, so that's that. And congenital toxoplasmosis is once again a triad of chorioretinitis, intracranial calcification, and hydro hydrocephalus, that's that. Transmission wise is cysts and oocysts in cat feces and fecal oral root. Okay, diagnosis is with the help of tachyzoids. And treatment is the meth for the pirate for pyrimethamine and sulfur diases on the ground for sulfur diazine from the picture we just saw. Nigleria fowleri is rapid fatal meningoencephalitis, one of the easiest parasites to remember very common for this one. That is, you will get questions telling you that you have a patient who has come to you with fever, headache, seizures, with a history of swimming in the pond in the morning, okay? Unfortunately, that poor patient of yours might have Nigleria fowleri infection and parasitic meningitis, <clears throat> which is a very fatal disease. Uh, if you do a CSF study, you will see that there are amoebas in the CSF like this one, okay, amoebas in this CSF. And we can prescribe amphotericin B to see if if it has any effect or not. Next one is trypanosomiasis, trypanosoma brutsi, for, for that matter, trypanosoma brutsi, Bruce Lee fighting African soldiers for 
trypanosoma brutzi causing African sleeping sickness, enlarged lymph nodes, fever, coma. The bite is from a tsetse fly, a very painful bite over there. If you do a blood smear, you will find tripping goats for trypomastigol. This is trypomastigol. And syrup man for suramin, that is responsible for causing, for creating bloodborne disease. And mellow yellow cans on the floor rolling for melasoprol for CNS and fat penetrations. Okay. These are the CNS infections. Are we clear? Have we understood them? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Yes? Okay. So before we uh, jump into this, the, the protozoas that are causing hematological uh, diseases, we will watch one physio video for Babesia. Okay? Because Babesia is... Uh, it's a very uh, difficult um, parasite to remember because it's not very it's not very common. Okay, but for for Plasmodium, we will not watch a video, obviously, because we can easily remember what Plasmodium is. What does plas what 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 disease does Plasmodium cause? Last answers, please. Malaria. Okay. Okay. Do you guys realize how a lot of students, they, they have the tendency of using sketchy for microbiology, like the picture mnemonics, how physio has the picture mnemonics, yes or no? Yes. Do you realize that you do, you do not need to use picture mnemonics for all the organisms? Because not all the organ because if you use picture mnemonics for all the organisms, you will get confused very easily. Okay, so that's that. But we will use picture, pic, we will use the picture mnemonics for some of the organisms, for example, that for example, Babesia, so that we don't forget this, okay? Because it's a very, um, it's a very uncommon organism, and we want to make sure that we remember everything. Okay, can we give the responsibility to one student who will, who can take the picture of this and post it on the group? Who can help us out today? Come to section eight of the parasites. Who can help us out today, taking the picture and posting it in the group? Anyone? Can I, can anyone help us out today, taking a picture of this? Okay, Dr. Mirdala, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to begin. This is the video for Babesia. We will uh, we will learn the, we will learn the Babesia first and then we will learn Plasmodium. Okay, so let's begin. This is our overview figure showing the parasites you need to know for step one. In this lecture, we will be talking about another protozoa that infects the blood, Babesia. Our story takes place in a daycare center with a bunch of babies. Here's one of the babies right here. Babies for Babesia. Babesia is spread through ticks. To help you remember this, we've included this giant tick toy right here. The babies like to jump on this toy and ride it like a horse. And to further emphasize that it's transmitted through ticks, that baby's holding this little container of Tic Tacs. And as he jumps on the giant tick toy, Tic Tacs fly through the air. So Tic Tacs and Tic Toy all are there to help you remember that this is transmitted through ticks. The specific type of tick is the Exodes tick. Remembering that Babesia is spread through the Exodes tick specifically, is not as important as just remembering that it spread through ticks. When the baby jumped on this tick toy, the toy spewed out a bunch of dust spores from inside. So basically dust had just accumulated within this tick toy and then it was forcefully squeezed out when the baby landed on it. These little dust spores represent sporozoites. Ticks will bite people and transmit the sporozoites of Babesia into the bloodstream. The workers at the daycare try to teach the babies a little about local geography. You can see a map up on the wall highlighting the northeastern United States. This map will help you remember that ticks carrying Babesia are mainly found in the northeastern United States. Let's go back to those dust spores forced out of the tick. The blast of the spores was so forceful that this other baby was blown back into this water trough. This water trough is where the kids wash their hands. Anyways, we like to use troughs to represent trophozoites. So this is what happens. When a tick bites a human, it transmits sporozoites. Once in the blood, those sporozoites enter red blood cells and become trophozoites. Landing in the water trough caused a remarkable splash. 
which knocked this other baby backwards. You can see the splashed baby stagger backwards and knock that pail of red paint over. The red paint looks kind of like blood, and the fact that the paint is spilling stands for loss of blood, or anemia. When sporozoites enter red blood cells, trophozoites will form and replicate, causing death to the red blood cells, leading to anemia. The splashing water from the trough is splashing on yet another unsuspecting victim. This little baby is innocently just finger painting all over the wall. Anyways, this red paint getting smeared on the wall represents a peripheral blood spare, which is a way to detect a Babesia infection. Appreciating his fellow baby's work of art, this other baby has come over and wanted to add to it. He's added a gold cross with some gold paint. This Maltese cross found inside the red blood cells is often referred to as a ring form. This is a microscopic image of a peripheral blood smear in a patient with babesiosis. You can see this red blood cell here in the middle and how it has this Maltese cross in the center of it. Another term you may come across is intraurethrocytic inclusions. This simply means inside the urethrocyte, which is exactly what this Maltese cross represents, an intraurethrocytic inclusion. These are also called ring forms, and this is kind of a strange term because it looks like a cross, not a ring. To help me remember that this can be called a ring form, I like to think of four skydivers falling through the sky and holding each other's hands. And you may have seen that in videos. And that way, they kind of form a ring. So we have one skydiver, another one, another one, and another one. And all four of them are holding hands and kind of form that ring. Another way to diagnose babesiosis is through a polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. To help you remember this, we've included a baby here dangling from the ceiling by three chains. I don't know where the adults are at this daycare. Anyways, three chains stands for polymerase chain reaction. Oh, here's an adult. He's pretty distracted with his protein drink, so he's unaware of the ruckus the babies have caused behind him. What are those strange things in his drink? They're protozoa. Anyways, protein sounds like protozoa. The Babesia parasite is considered a protozoan, and we added little chunks of protozoa in there. So protein for protozoa. It looks like this guy shares his protein drinks and feeds them to the babies. Look at this baby all tuckered out after having some protein drink. Looks like the bottle lid popped off and the drink is now spilling on the floor. This sleepy baby represents the fatigue that patients with Babesia experience. It makes sense that patients would be fatigued. After all, a symptom of anemia is fatigue. The daycare center likes to keep the place warm, so they keep these heat lamps around. Those heat lamps represent fever, which is another symptom of babesiosis. When you think of fever, it's a good idea to think of the general flu-like symptoms such as malaise, headaches, and muscle aches. So again, when you think of heat lamps, think fever and flu-like symptoms. Now some of the employees of the daycare are actually pretty attentive. Like this lady here, she's busy cleaning up all the dirty diapers on the floor. This cleaning woman stands for clindamycin, which is one of the treatments for babesia. You may have noticed that crown on her head. It's made of paper and this cute little baby here has placed it on her head to make her look like a queen. It's a cute gesture, especially in the context of her cleaning up the baby's diapers. If you look at it closely, you'll see the number 9 written on it. This 9 plus the fact that she looks like a queen represents quinine. I'm intentionally mispronouncing quinine to help you remember it better. It's actually called quinine. Anyways, queen, 9, for quinine. Another treatment for babesiosis. In reality, quinine and clindamycin are given together as treatment. That's why these two ideas are represented with this single worker. So give quinine and clindamycin together. Now look at this other worker over here trying to take care of the baby on this side of the room. He was giving the baby an ice cream cone and accidentally spilled it on the baby's toe. A toe with an ice cream cone on it stands for atovaquone. A toe and cone for atovaquone. This is yet another treatment you can use for Babesia. Now look at this baby grasping this hanger. It's a fairly smart baby and he's created a zip line for himself using string in this hanger. That's pretty innovative. Anyways, this zip line stands for azithromycin which is a macrolide used to treat Babesia. So zipline, azithromycin. Just like quinine and clindamycin are administered together as treatment, azithromycin and etovaquone are administered together. For this reason, the zipline and the toe with the cone are close together. So again, you can treat Babesia with azithromycin plus etovaquone together. Now this cute little baby here has some red paint on his hands. He thought it'd be funny to spread red paint on this worker's shirt. In the process, the baby inadvertently made the shape of a spleen and placed it in the area the spleen is located. The spleen mark represents the fact that the spleen is necessary for clearing the infection. In fact, asplenic patients often have a much worse presentation. So spleen spot stands for the importance of the spleen in clearing Babesia. Okay, so Dr. Medula, were you able to take a picture? Okay, so that is all about Babesia. Basically, uh, one of the highest yield thing that you have to remember about Babesia is Babesia is responsible for causing fever and uh, hemolytic anemia in northeastern, in the northeastern states, for example, uh, for example, New York also falls under that one. 
okay, New York, New Jersey, and all of those states over here. And the thing that you have to remember is the diagnosis is more important for USMLE step one than um, the infection itself is because in diagnosis, there are two things that you can see. First of all is you can see the ring form of Babesia. You can see the ring form of the, of the, of the Babesia like this one. Another one is USMLE loves to make questions about the fact that Babesia has a Maltese cross pattern. <coughs> Excuse me. It has a Maltese cross pattern like this, okay? Like a Maltese cross pattern appearance in the blood. So that's that. And the treatment is also high yield. You can give atovoquon, quinine, or azithromycin over there, okay? So uh, Babesia is responsible for causing babesiosis, fever and hemolytic anemia. It's predominant in Northeastern USA. The take is the same that for Borrelia, okay? And um, this one, you will get a multiple questions from over here trying to describe that this is Babesia by saying that these patients have Maltese cross patterns on uh, blood smear. That's, that is very high yield for Babesia, okay? The next uh, parasite that we want to go for, okay? The next parasite that we want to go for is plasmodium. Plasmodium is very high yield because it's responsible for causing malaria. Malaria is basically a disease that is that where you have fever, headache, anemia, and splenomegaly is very high yield. You can get splenomegaly. The types of plasmodiums that we deal with is vivex or an ovary, falciparum, and plasmodium, mal plasmodium malaria. Uh, what happens is in plasmodium vivex and ovary, there's a 48 hour cycle, meaning that this is known as a tertian fever. That is, if you have fever on day one, you will have fever that will not be there on day two. And on day three, the fever will be there again. Okay, so the fevers are actually 48 hours apart. And in plasmodium vivex infection, what you have is you have the plasmodium vivex that lives in a dormant form. So there are multiple questions which they like to make from over here that they received, um, they, they want to know which form of plasmodium has a higher tendency of forming a dormant or a hypnozoidic form. And the only plasmodium that can form a hypnozoid, always remember this, this is a very high yield question. The only plasmodium that can form a hypnozoid is plasmodium vivex, okay? Next one. Next one is plasmodium falciparum. Plasmodium falciparum will cause irregular fever. That is, there is no particular pattern to when and how the fever will happen. The fever can happen on day one, two, they can be absent on three, four, five, and then they can be present again at six or seven. And uh, uh, believe it or not, they mentioned the fevers in step one to help you identify which type of plasmodium you are dealing with. So please keep a very close eye to the fever pattern for malaria. If it's one, if it's day one fever, and day two, the fever is not there, the fever is back on day three, they're talking about Vivex. If they're talking about day one fever, if the fever is not there on day two, three, right? Two, three, uh, and then the fever comes back at um, the 72 hours after the first day, right? Quartan fever, meaning at day four, if it comes back. So first day you have fever, second and third day you do not have fever. Then on day four, you have the same high rising fever again. And they will mention this, to help you identify you're dealing with plasmodium plasmodium malaria okay so this is for quartan fever and they will also tell you that the fever pattern is irregular for plasmodium falciparum okay another one is plasmodium falciparum has a um, tendency of causing what we say is, is cerebral malaria what happens is the uh, parasites they um, occlude the RBC. As you can see over here, that uh, over here is in the blood, in the smear, there are trophozoidic rings. There are rings of trophozoids, right? There are rings of trophozoids. And what, what they do is they destroy the RBCs, right? And these parasitic RBCs, they have a tendency of occluding blood vessels. If they occlude the capillaries in the brain, they, this can cause cerebral malaria, cerebral malaria. And the sign symptoms will be according to the region of the brain which is occluded. For example, if there's frontal lobe occlusion, there could be changes in behavior, thought patterns. And um, then after that, then, then if it affects the uh, temporal lobe, there will be one 
uh, sort of a, uh, a presentation. If it affects the parietal lobe, there will be another sort of presentation. So it depends on um, which part of the brain they will go and occlude. They can go also go go and occlude the uh, kidney and lungs. So they so there could be acute tubular uh, necrosis sort of a presentation, and also in in the lungs it can cause pulmonary ischemia. So that's that. Transmission is by female anopheles mosquito. Okay, I'm pretty sure we all know about this. And in blood smears, you will find that these patients, they have trophozoids. They have trophozoidic ring within the RBC. There, there are rings of trophozoids within the RBCs. That's number one. Another one is there, there, there could be, um, there could be another one is, if this is an RBC over here, okay. So, and so one is, so what the malaria does is the parasite, they multiply inside the RBC and then they, um, they will multiply in such an amount that they break through the RBC and then they leave. So th this can also cause hemolytic anemia. So this th basically causes hemolysis, right? Because they break down the RBC. So you can either see the trophozoids inside the RBC like this one, or an another one is you can see this form of the parasite known as the schizoid, known as the schizoid, which can contain merozoids, that is red granules, known as Schaffner's dot or Schaffner's stippling throughout the RBC, that is this dot-like presentations inside the RBC. Okay, so that's what you can see, and this is more commonly seen with plasmodium vivax. Okay. okay. There's a very high yield question which I want to discuss, <clears throat> uh, which I need you to write this down over here. Okay, there is, uh, there is, a discussion for prophylaxis, especially in step one. How long should you continue um, treatment that is treatment with mefloquine, right? We give, we give the drug mefloquine if chloroquine is resistant. And we can also give mefloquine for prophylaxis, okay? Let's say, for example, you have a patient who wants to go to a malaria who wants to go to a malaria endemic zone and uh, they go to the malaria endemic zone and then they come back. How long should they continue to have the drug? How long should they continue to have the drug after they come back home from the malaria endemic area? Does anyone have any idea about the answer? Two weeks, very close, but not the correct answer. Anyone else? Three weeks, not close. Six months is not even close. My apologies, 10 days, not close. Okay, let me tell you the scientific cause and then after that, you guys will never make this mistake again, okay? okay. First of all, uh, Plasmodium vivax and Ovali are the only one which, which, can remain, which can remain dormant. Where can we find such informations? From me, <laughs> okay? You can find such informations from me because I'm your tutor. Okay, if you need information, I, I will provide them for you. Okay, that, that, that's a very good question, Dr. Jan. Where can we find such information? You can find such information from me, from us. Don't worry about it. We'll tell you all the things you need to know for step one. Okay, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the lecture. Okay, now, um, we were talking about uh, the mefloquine treatment, okay? Now, uh, what happens is the reason why we want to prescribe mefloquine is we want to prescribe mefloquine for, you guys were close, two weeks, three weeks, no one said four weeks. Okay, if you guys said four weeks, that, that would have been the correct answer. The reason being is because the hypnozoids, they remain dormant in the liver for exactly four weeks. Okay, so, so even if you discontinue the treatment after two weeks, the, the hypnozoids will stay dormant in the, in the liver for two more weeks and this hypnozoid from the from the liver okay they can get released into the blood form the trophozoids again and that trophozoids can go and affect the rbcs okay so the liver schizones we want to we want to kill the liver schizones so the mefloquine should be continued for four more weeks okay are we clear about this are we clear about this you guys have got it down so mefloquine should be continued for four more weeks after the patient comes back from a malaric endemic area to make sure that all the liver skids on are not converted to merozoids and trophozoids in the RBCs. Okay, so that's that. 
Now, <clears throat> so there are two ways you can diagnose malaria. And then there's this extra piece of information which we gave you. And now we'll, we'll talk about the treatment. Treatment is we will prescribe chloroquine. Okay. Do you guys remember how Donald Trump said that we should have chloroquine for coronavirus? That it's a very safe and um, it's a very normal drug. Everyone can have chloroquine. Okay. Look what happened to him. He got kicked out of the White House. Okay. So chloroquine should be, should be exclusively prescribed for malaria. Chloroquine for sensitive species. If chloroquine is resistant, we can use mefloquine or at atovaquone or proguanil, okay? But number one drug of choice is chloroquine. If chloroquine doesn't work, then we can give mefloquine or atovaquone or proguanil. If it's a life-threatening in infection, we can use intravenous quinine or quinidine uh, or artesunate, okay? And for plasmodium vivax and ovary, we can give primaquine for hypnozoid. Okay, primaquine for hyp hypnozoid. Um, there is, if you can only remember chloroquine, and if chloroquine doesn't work, we can give mefloquine or proguanil, then that's enough, to be honest. And that is, that is enough because they don't really like to go to, into the depth of which drug you, you would prescribe for which parasitic form of malaria. So if you can remember chloroquine, if not chloroquine, then mefloquine and adovacone, that's more than enough. And this piece of information over here is also asked. You will get two questions from step, from you will step one about this. So don't forget this one. Okay. Help us. So are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Can we move on to the next one? Okay, let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to um, visceral infections. Okay, let's move on to visceral infections. Okay. Visceral infections, we will, we will talk about two things. Okay, we will talk about Trypanosoma cruzi and we will talk about Leishmania donovani. Okay, Leishmania donovani. To prevent uh, confusion, let's do, a, let's ask you a small question. First of all, if you have RBCs inside the parasite. Which parasite am I talking about? RBCs inside the parasite. RBCs inside the parasite. Endamoeba. Testolytica. If you have parasite inside the RBCs, which organism am I talking about? Malaria. Okay, good. Okay. Next one. We will talk about visceral infection. Okay, we will talk about visceral infection. And we will talk about two organisms, trypanosoma and Leishmania. Is everyone ready? Do I have everyone's attention? Okay. So let's begin. <clears throat> okay. First of all, we're going to talk about Trypanosoma brutzi. Before we talked about Trypanosoma brutzi, Trypanosoma brutzi is responsible for causing which disease? Fast answers, please. African sleeping sickness. Okay. African sleeping sickness. Um, okay. And uh, another one is, another one is uh, Trypanosoma cruzi is responsible. If you can, if you can remember this one, that there is a car. Okay, for example, you are cruising in a car. Let's say someone is cruising in a car. I, I, the reason I'm doing this is because I don't want you to get confused with Trypanosoma cruzi and Trypanosoma brutzi. Okay. So we're talking about Trypanosoma cruzi, that is you are cruising in a car and I'm sorry, no, not you. Uh, let's say this one guy is cruising in a car and this guy over here is not a random guy. He is a very morbidly obese person. Okay, he is a morbidly obese person who is cruising in the car. Okay, he is very obese. The reason why I'm talking about a morbidly obese character on a car is because I want to bring your attention to the fact that, um, okay, the name of this guy is, 
the name of this guy is Shagas. Shagas, okay? The name of this guy is Shagas. Shagas is a fat, morbidly obese character who is cruising on a car. And this guy is your picture mnemonic for Trypanosoma, Trypanosoma cruzi. So cruising in the car for Trypanosoma cruzi, the name of the guy is Shagas for the fact that it causes Shagas disease. And the fact that he is morbidly obese will help you understand that everything with Trypanosoma cruzi is big and dilated. Meaning, first of all, if it affects the heart, it would cause DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. If it affects the esophagus, it will cause mega esophagus, meaning that it will cause, which disease will, will, will it cause? If it causes mega esophagus, what's the name of the disease? Fast answers, please. Esophageal achalasia, achalasia, esophageal achalasia, right? So mega esophagus. If it affects the colon, it will cause mega colon. Everything about this guy is big, big heart, big esophagus, big colon. DCM, mega esophagus, mega colon. Another one is this guy has, remember this, he has a pirate's patch, pirate's patch in one eye. Do you know why he has a pirate's patch in one eye? Because one one eye of, of his, one eye is swollen, okay? So he has unilateral periorbital swelling. Unilateral periorbital swelling, this sign is known as, the sign is known as Romanus sign. The sign is known as Romana sign. Are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay, this is known as Romana sign. Transmission is, this happens with the name, uh, this happens because you get bitten by a bug. The name of this bug is known as triatom bug, or this is also known as a kissing bug, okay? This bug is known as kissing bug or triatom bug, which will bite you. And after it bites you, it will defecate or put their feces in your bite wound and their feces are the ones that contains the organism, okay? The organism is basically a tripomastigot. Once again, you will see over here, you will see a tripomastigot. So if this is a if this is a smear, you will see this sort of a presentation, okay? This tripomastigot, like one, the one which you saw in Trypanosoma brutzi with a big flagella, once again, okay? And the treatment for this one is we have to prescribe Benznitazole or Nifertimox, Nifertimox. The way that you can easily remember Benznitazole, okay, the way that you, you can easily remember Benznitazole is the car, this car is no ordinary car. This is a Mercedes Benz, okay? This is a Mercedes Benz, okay? So Mercedes Benz for Benz Nidazol. And this guy over here, not only is he a very rich guy who is extremely fat and morbidly obese with DCM, mega esophagus and uh, mega colon and uniorbital pirate like swelling of his eyes driving a Mercedes Benz. To top it all off, he is a big fan of wearing fur coats. So he is very diva-like, okay? So that's that. He's wearing a fur coat. Fur coat for Nifertimox. Nifertimox. And Benz for Benz Nidazole. Benz Nidazole. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear? Yes. So that is all basically, that is all you need to know from Trypanosoma cruzi. If you can just uh, remember this small diagram over here, this will be enough. So that's that, okay, next one. The next one that I wanna to talk to you about is the yellow part, the, the yellow part. Okay, can anyone tell me what the yellow part is over here? Let me see. What is the yellow part I drew over here? What does the yellow part represent? 
for a code. Very good. Okay. Just wanted to see if, if I had everyone's attention or not. So, Dr. Osam, the yellow part over here is this guy, Shagas. He's wearing a fur coat for Nifer Timox. Okay, Nifer Timox. Okay, next one. Next one is Lishmania Donovani or Lishmaniasis. Have you guys ever seen a Lishmania patient with elephantasis? Have you guys ever seen Lishmania patient or Wusheria Bancrofty patient? Okay, both of them are uh, okay. Both of them are different things, but there are a lot of people who mix them up. Elephantiasis is a disease that happens with Wusheria Bancrofty. Uh, Lishmaniasis is another disease that can that is responsible for causing visceral and cutaneous Lishmaniasis. Visceral and cutaneous Lishmaniasis. Okay. Lishmania Donovani. Sorry. Lishmania Donovani is responsible for causing visceral Lishmaniasis and cutaneous Lishmaniasis. Visceral Lishmaniasis is, has the same presentation as leukemia, okay? Meaning that the presentation is very similar to leukemia. That is, these patients have fever, hepatosplenomegaly, and they also have pancytopenia. Just like leukemia, they have fever, hepatosplenomegaly, and pancytopenia. And cutaneous leishmaniasis have skin ulcers, skin ulcers. Okay, so over here, leishmaniasis they have a they have a tendency. Okay, for example, if I draw this picture over here, for example, if I draw this picture, this is the picture of a dog. Okay, let's say that this is the dog-like character over here. Not, I apologize for not being able to draw a dog, okay? Looks like an insect, but it's a dog, okay? So dog on a leash, dog on a leash inside, inside a cage. Dog on a leash inside a cage. Okay, we will use the cage as physio uses the cage. Cage for macrophage and dog on a leash for the fact that Lishmaniasis, Lishmaniasis, they have a tendency of surviving inside the macrophage, okay? They have a tendency of surviving inside the macrophage as a mastigot, a mastigotic form, a mastigotic form over here, as you can see, okay? That they have a tendency of surviving inside um, the macrophage as a mastigotic form. The example, this is the macrophage over here. And in the macrophage, you will see that there are multiple types of presentations over here, okay? Which, or, which another organism has a tendency of surviving inside the macrophage or hiding in the macrophage? Which organism? Histoplasma, okay? And brucella, very good. And now you have leishmania. Okay, brucella, histoplasma, and leishmania. So the macrophage will contain the macrophage will contain the amastigots, coccyl, coccyl bernetti. Okay, coccyl bernetti is not that high yield, so we'll talk about histoplasma, brucella, and leishmania. The the treatment is for these patients, you can prescribe them amphotericin B or sodium steepogluconate. Sodium steepogluconate. Uh, the, this treatment is not very high yield, so don't worry about this. Although the treatment for trypanosoma cruzi is very high yield, so you cannot forget that one. Okay, so that is all for trypanosoma cruzi and leishmaniasis. The transmission of leishmaniasis is that you will get affected when you get bitten by a sandfly. Okay, so when you get bit, when you get bitten by a sandfly, then you can get affected. So that's that. Okay, is everyone clear about this? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Okay, so with that being said, do you guys want to take a small break before we come back and start talking about sexually transmitted diseases? Okay, how long do you guys want to take the break for? Fifteen minutes. Okay, so we will begin the lecture at 11.25. We'll take a break for 15 minutes.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Is everyone back? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, great. So let's begin our discussion on parasites. Okay, so far we have finished uh, GI protozoa, CNS protozoa, heme protozoa, and visceral protozoas. The last uh, protozoa that I want to talk to you about today is sexually transmitted protozoa, that is, that is Trichomonas vaginalis. Trichomonas vaginalis. Trichomonas vaginalis is a parasitic vaginitis that is caused by sexual transmission, okay? So basically this is an STD, it's a sexually transmitted disease uh, that, ha that happens because of uh, unprotected uh, sexual intercourse. And what happens is over here, there is the cl clinical presentation or the clinical features are that over here you have, you have foul smelling, foul smelling vaginal discharge. The discharge, the color of the discharge is greenish. These are all points that will be mentioned in your question stem, okay? Foul smellers, smells foul smelling, greenish vaginal discharge. Along with this, there could be there could be associated of, um, of mild fever or itching or burning sensations, okay? The difference between uh, parasitic vaginitis and bacterial vaginitis, which is caused by Gardenella vaginalis, is that the discharge in Gardenella vaginalis has a fishy smell, but it does not have a foul smell. This one has a foul smell, that one has a fishy smell. That one was a grayish, grayish color. This one is greenish in color. Then that one had clue cells. This one has trophozoids. This one has trophozoids. So what you, what you can see over here is that these patients, when you take a small amount of their discharge and you, and you prepare them on a wet mount and try to see when microscopy was there, what you will see is you will see trophozoids. Trophozoids look something like this, okay? Like a kite almost with a central line and one, one nuclei over here, S something like this, okay? And the cervix of the patient from um, recurrent itching and burning sensations, the cervix will appear swollen, indurated, and this is known as strawberry, strawberry cervix. This is known as strawberry cervix, okay? This is what happens in a vaginal infection, okay? Treatment-wise, it's actually pretty easy to, to treat this. The treatment is metronidazole. Treatment is metronidazole. Okay, so that's that. Treatment is metronidazole. Okay, I want you guys to I want you guys to properly differentiate bacterial vaginitis, parasitic vaginitis, and fungal infections of the vagina. Okay, foul smelling greenish discharge is trichomonas or parasitic. Fishy smelling grayish discharge is bacterial and white curd like appearance with no smell, no smell and white color, okay? No smell and white color, that is for candidiasis, vaginal candidiasis, okay? That's that. So that's all for the protozoa. So this is Trichomonas vaginalis. This is the trophozoid that you will see over here, okay? It's a foul smelling greenish discharge with itching and burning sen sensation, okay? S the transmission is sexual transmission, okay? Another one is, if you have a patient with bacterial vaginitis, with Gardenella vaginalis, 
when you treat the patient, do you have to treat the husband? Okay. For trichomonas vaginalis, if you treat the patient, do you have to treat the husband? Okay. Yes, this is sexual harassment. Okay, so that's that. Pa metronidazole for patient and partner. Okay. Okay. Now, the reason for us taking that break before um, this is because I want you guys to be in a clear head for now because I really want you to put your uh, attention to this one. The reason I want you to put your attention to this one is because the amount of information that you have over here is overwhelming at first. Okay, it's overwhelming at first, but there's a way how you can how you can learn all of this very easily. Okay, and we will tell you exactly how all these information for all these parasites. And unfortunately, every one of these parasites are heavily, heavily tested in step one. I wish I could have told you that this is something which you do not have to worry about because you will not be tested about the, on this, but I can't say that because uh, they actually do test you on this. So I need you to put your attention to this part of the lecture right now so that we can solidify this information. Okay, and I know we will. So first of all, I need you to focus on nematodes. So we are done with protozoa. Now we have moved on to nematodes, nematodes, okay? Nematodes are the ones, are the parasites that are present in GI, in skin, and they also they are also transmitted by bites, okay? So first of all, for the GI nematodes, GI nematodes, okay? We will use the mnemonic EAT, E-A-T-T-T, -T -T -T. so three T's, E and A, okay? So E for enterobiasis, enterobias vermicularis, then A for ascariasis or ascariasis lumbricoids, then T for toxocaracanis, then T for Trichinella spiralis and T4 treacherous trichura. Okay, so that's the enterobiasis, ascariasis, trichinella spiralis, toxocara, toxocara canis, and treacherous trichura. So we'll talk about these ones first. Okay, so so I will tell you exactly what you need to know, and after that we will look on the we'll look back on the table. Okay, so okay, so first one. I want to talk about is E, E for enterobiasis. Enterobiasis, enterobius vermicularis is a very common parasitic presentation. This is basically uh, anal pruritus. Enterobiasis is this is basically anal pruritus. And this is very common. And uh, every one of us at one point in our lives might or might not have been affected with enterobiasis. Okay. And the reason is because this is a GI infection is because this is a fecal oral transmission, fecal oral transmission, meaning that uh, meaning that uh, these patients, when they get affected with this parasite, it's because of, of consuming unhygienic food, right? And what happens is that these parasites, they lay eggs and these eggs, they mature into another parasite and that parasite is discarded uh, via the feces. And in the anal region, that parasite stays. And when it moves over there, when the parasite moves in the anal region, this causes extreme itchiness and pruritus. So that is known as enterobiasis. This another name is it's a pinworm. Okay, it's a pinworm. Now, so that's all you need to know for this one. Don't worry about the treatment. We will study the treatments later. Okay, Treat, we, we, we will study the treatments for all the nematodes later. That's all for enterobiasis. Next one. Next one is ascariasis lumbricoides. Ascariasis lumbricoid. Ascariasis lumbricoid is um, is what we call is a roundworm. Okay. Ascariasis lumbricoid. Uh, what happens is that these ascariasis lumbricoids these cause GI infections because these are fecal oral transmitted parasites, fecal oral transmitted parasites. And these parasites, when they are ingested, they go through the GI tract. And since they can move very quickly, what happens is that they 
perforate your intestine and enter your bloodstream. They perforate your intestine and enter your, your bloodstream. And then they, they may go to different parts of the body and lay eggs and then grow over there. That's one way. Another one is they can perforate your intestines. And um, I, I mean, before they perforate your, your intestine, they have a tendency of going and obstructing. Yeah, they have a tendency of going and obstructing the ileocecal, uh, I mean, the biliary tract. Okay. They have a tendency of going and obstructing the biliary tract over there. The thing is that these patients, when they when they are defecating, the parasite is released in the form of an egg. Okay, the parasite is released in the form of an egg, and th this egg of the parasite, this looks like the outer shell has doorknob like appearance doorknob like appearance so knobby coated outer shell appearance of ascariasis okay these are the parasites that either lays eggs in the intestine perforates your intestine enters your bloodstream and grows in other parts of the tissues or they can mature in your intestine go all the way up from your gi tract to the nose and they can come out from your mouth and from your nose. And I'm pretty sure one or two of us, <coughs> excuse me, have heard this. Have you guys ever heard of patients vomiting or coming up with parasites from their nose and mouth? Yes or no? It's a very disgusting image, which I'm trying to paint in your picture, but I mean, which I'm trying to paint in your mind, but I'm pretty sure you guys have seen this or even in a, in a clinical setting. Okay, you guys should have seen this. So that is ascariasis lubricoides. Okay, so we are done with one, two, next one. The next one that I want to discuss is, okay, the next one that I want to discuss is trichinella spiralis. Okay, the next one that I want to discuss is trichinella spiralis. Okay, trichinella spiralis is, um, also a fecal oral transmitted parasite, okay? It's a fecal oral uh, transmitted, oh, just, give me, just give me one second, please. Okay. So uh, we are going to discuss about Trichinella spiralis. This is basically a fecal oral transmitted parasite. And uh, this happens because of, of ingestion of meat, especially pork meat, which is undercooked. What happens is that when you, uh, when, when the parasite enters your body, the parasite perforates the intestine, enters the blood, Okay, it perforates the intestine, enters the blood, and when it enters the blood, it goes to, it goes through the muscles. Okay, it goes to the muscles. So spiralis for the for the striated appearance of the muscle will help you realize that trichinella spiralis is for, uh, it, it's for uh, the fact that this parasite has the tendency of going to striated muscles. When it goes to the striated muscles, it causes muscular inflammation, okay? And this paralysis, they also have a tendency of going and causing um, what we say is uh, fever, vomiting, it's all there, but they also go and affect the eyes, okay? They also go and they affect the eyes, especially, or especially around the eyes. What they, what they do is they cause periorbital edema, swelling in the eyes, okay? swelling in the eyes. So these two images are the ones which is important. First of all, muscle, for striated muscles, trichinella spiralis, and and then in the eyes. Is it high yield? Yes. Yes, it's high yield. They will ask you questions about this. Okay, trichinella, that, that is trichinella spiralis. Okay, next one. Next one is toxocaracanus. Next one is toxocaracanus. 
Toxocaracanis. Okay, so far we are done with enterobiosis for anal pruritus, ascariasis for causing biliary tract obstruction, knobby coated appearance of eggs, the only high yield things you need to know. Then trichinella spiralis for affecting the spiral muscles and periorbital edema. Next one is Toxocaracanis. Toxocaracanis is known as, okay, Toxocara. The word Toxocara has the word car in it. Okay, and I want you to focus on this word car. Car is basically this parasite. What this does is this parasite uses a car in the body. And with the help of a car, it goes to different organs and goes and visits and stays in the hotels of those organs. What that means is this organ, this uh, parasite is known as visceral larva migraines. It loves migrating. It loves migrating in your body. First of all, when you infect, when you have this parasite, this is fecal oral transmission. Once again, it causes intestinal perforation. And then with the help of the car of Toxocara, right? Toxocara for car will help you realize that this is a migrating visceral larva. What they do is they go to different parts of the body. First of all, they go to the heart. They can cause myocarditis. If they go to the liver, they can cause hepatitis. If they go to the eyes, they can cause uvi conjunctivitis, right? And blindness. And they can also go to the brain and they can cause seizures and coma. They, they can cause coma and seizures. Okay, so that's that's that. That is Toxocara, Toxocara canis. Okay, so one, two, three, four, last one. The last one that we will do is Trichuris trichura. Okay, Trichuris trichura. The only thing you have to know about this is Trichuris trichura is a fecal oral parasite. And this parasite is a bit lesser yield from all the four counterparts of GI nematodes. The only thing you have to remember from this one is they cause rectal prolapse. That's all. They cause severe diarrhea and rectal prolapse, especially in children. That's all you have to know. Okay, that's all you have to know. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Last one. The last one name is uh, Trichuris trichura. Trichuris trichura, and they can cause rectal prolapse. Okay. So, uh, what I need you guys to do, okay, are we, first of all, just let me know if you guys have understood these things or not. Yes or no? Have you guys understood these parasites? I have tried to make this as easy as possible. Only the high yield things that will be asked, only the high yield things. Enterobiasis will cause anal pruritus. Ascariasis can cause biliary tract obstruction and knobby coated eggs in the feces. Trichinella spiralis can cause muscle inflammation and periorbital edema. Toxocara canis uses a car to roam around in your body, goes to the heart, causes myocarditis, hepatitis, meningitis, and cephalitis, conjunctivitis, uveitis, depends on where it goes. And then another one is Trichuris trichura, which causes, which is a whipworm, which causes a rectal prolapse. Okay. So I've tried my best to make sure that only the high the, the high yield things are there. Now, what I need, need you guys to do is, I need you guys to do is, I need you guys to read this. Enterobiasis, ascariasis, trichinella spiralis, trichuris trichura, toxicara, toxicara canis. I want you to read this. I'll, I, I know that I, 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 I will not test you guys, but for this one, I will. I wanna make sure that you guys are not overwhelmed with this knowledge. So I'll give you guys three minutes to go over this whole thing I'll, after we have Study this, then I'll move forward to the next one. Okay, I'll move forward to the cutaneous, cutaneous nematode. So you guys have exactly three minutes. Okay.
Okay, is everyone done? Okay. Okay, so what is the name of the parasite that is responsible for causing anal pruritus? Enter bias, okay. There's one thing which I forgot to mention about enter biases. The parasite, they remain in the anal region, right? For example, the, the parasite, they will remain in the anal region, okay? Right, over here they will remain in the anal anal region like this, okay? So if we want to uh, diagnose this parasite, what we can do is we can place a tape over here, a tape, and then we can stick the tape and we can take the tape out to see if the parasite are attached to the tape. And then we can study the parasite under the microscope to see its actual presence or absence. So that's what we can do. So we can do a tape test, okay? And that's that, okay, good. Next one is, well, what is the name of the organism where we can see knobby coated eggs in feces under my under microscope? It is responsible for causing biliary tract obstruction. As curious is very good. Next one is, what is the name of the organism that is responsible for causing muscle inflammation and muscle pain? Trichinella spiralis, okay. Next one is, what is the name of the organism that is responsible for causing larval, um, that is responsible for causing rectal prolapse in children? Rectal prolapse in children. Okay, another one is, what is the, what is, uh, the name of the organism that is responsible for causing, for roaming around in your body with a car? and causing damage in different parts of the body. It's called toxocaracanus. Okay, it's called toxocaracanus. Okay. So that's that, that's great. Now, next one is, um, Next one is, okay, next one which you want to focus on is cutaneous nematodes, okay? Nematodes, cutaneous nematodes, that, that's what we want to focus on right now. Cutaneous nematodes, cutaneous, cutaneous nematodes, okay, are the one which, which is present on the skin that can cause skin, and that can cause cutaneous skin or dermatological or cutaneous, okay? is known as S A N S A N S A N stands for strongyloid starcolaris ankylostoma duodenale and nectar americanus okay americanus now the first one that I want to talk to you about is strongyloid star starcolaris strongyloidosis strongyloids are basically what they do is um, for example um, the larva of this, the larval form of this parasite, this stays in the soil. So for example, if you're walking on the soil barefooted, this larva can penetrate your skin. And when it penetrates your skin, this enters your bloodstream. And when it enters the bloodstream, it, it travels to different parts of the body states over there and causes infections and inflammations. So this is strongular starcularis. This is also known as a threadworm. Okay, so the culprit over here is the larval form. So larva in soil. Larva in soil. That is strongyloid star, strongyloid star, star polaris. Okay. Next one. Next one is, next one is ankylostoma duodenale. Okay. Ankylostoma duodenale is once again, another type of cutaneous nematode. The culprit over here is once again, the larva. Okay. The larva, what they do is when they, um, the larva, what they do is when they um, penetrate your skin, they travel in the they travel in the body, and then they cause microcytic anemia. Basically, is what what they do is they survive by sucking the blood from the blood in the intestinal walls. So they suck the blood out, and this loss of blood is the one that is responsible for having microcytic anemia. Okay, and another one is this: uh, when this when this parasite this travels in your body, 
in the uh, through the bloodstream, this induces an itching and pruritic type of response. So what happens is you, as a patient, when they are moving, this causes itchiness and pruritus and the patient starts itching and scratching the places resulting in a rash. This rash has a shape of a snake. It's as if a snake is moving through your body. Okay, for example, okay. If the larva moves like this, then you are scratching this place, right? And th there is a rash over here and the rash is om almost like a snake. So this is known as a serpentinous rash. This is known as a serpentinous rash. Okay, that is ankylostoma duodenale. Next one, next one is nectar americanus. Nectar am americanus, nectar americanus and ankylostoma duodenale has more or less the exact clinical presentation. Both of them are responsible for penetrations of skin and then moving in the body, causing microstatic anemia and serpiginous rash. That's all. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Is everyone clear about this? Can you guys hear my voice? Can I get some feedbacks, please? So that's that. Okay, now what I need you guys to do is I need you guys to read these two, Strongyloid, Stargolaris, and Nectar Americanus. I need you guys to read these two things. I'll give you guys two minutes for these two, and then I'll move on to Oncocercosis, Loa Loa, and Wuxeria Bancrofti, okay? So two minutes on the clock. Serpiginous rash means shaped like a serpent, like a snake, like a snake-like, snake-like appearance. Almost looks looks like this. Okay, that's a serpiginous rash. Okay, are we done reading strongyloidosis and ankylostoma duodenale? Yes or no? Everyone, okay. Okay, now I'll go back to the last one. So we talked about GI, GI nematodes. We talked about cutaneous nematodes. Now we will talk about um, nematodes that will, that spreads via bites. Okay, so bite the nematodes that spreads via bites, and will, the mnemonic is low. Low four, number one is Loa Loa, then O for Onkosharka Balzulas, and W for Wusheria Bancrofti. Okay, so first of all, the first one that I'm gonna talk to you about is Loa Loa. Okay, Loa Loa is basically the, the, the only thing that you have to understand about Loa Loa is that Loa Loa will 
spread via the bite of a fly known as deer fly, okay? Deer fly is more common. Then you also have horse fly and mango fly. Those are not very high yield, but deer fly is more common than those two. Altogether, it's not that common at all. But the, then again, out of all those three, deer fly is more common. Biting of a deer fly will spread the parasite lower, lower. And when this, par when this parasite, when this enters into your blood, this will move through your body and this will it'll go to your eyes. This is the only high yield thing. So patients, these patients will have these patients will have parasites moving on their eyes. This is known as parasitic conjunctivitis or warm in conjunctiva due to lower lower. Okay, how many of us are very disgusted and grossed out right now? To just because I know a lot of a lot of patients. I mean, a lot of students. They have they cannot stand when anything comes in close contact to their eyes. People, some okay, Dr. Midula, Dr. Nikki, okay, make no problem. Remember this loa loa on the eyes for this one. And what was the name of the parasite that was responsible for causing unilateral periorbital swelling? Unilateral periorbital swelling, trypanosoma cruzi. Okay, what was the name of that sign? What was the name of that sign? Romana sign. Okay, good. Next one. Next one is Oncosharca volvulus. Oncosharca volvulus. Okay, Oncosharca volvulus is spread by the by the bite of another fly, known as a black fly. Everything about Oncosharca volvulus is black. Just remember the word black for everything. The fly is a black fly. Okay. Over here. Over here, the fly, the fly is a is a black fly, and over here, this um, parasite can actually uh, move in your blood again, all the way back to your eye, and this time, instead of just being a worm in the conjunctiva, this can make you blind. Oncosharca volvulus is one of the most uh, is the only parasitic cause of blindness. Oncosharca volvulus is the most only parasitic cause of blindness. I'm repeating it twice because it's high yield. Okay, it, this is known as river blindness. River blindness, and then this also call this also causes small nodules in your body because of, because what happens is that this parasite this goes and attacks the elastic fibers, and uh, this loss of elastic fibers. Uh, results in the formation of some nodules uh, beneath the skin, and that nodules are also known as black nodules. So you have black nodules, black black sight, meaning blindness, and black fly, the female black fly that is responsible for transmitting this parasite. That is Oncosharca volvulus. Next one is Wuchsia bancrofti. Wuchsia is this is responsible for causing lymphatic phyleriasis or what we call elephantiasis. Elephantiasis, basically what happens is you get bitten by a female mosquito. Okay, you get bitten, you, you get bitten by a female mosquito. And after you get bitten by the mosquito, the parasite, it invades your bloodstream. It goes all the way to your lymphatics. Okay, especially the lymphatics of the lower extremities. And it blocks the lymphatic, so as a result, the, all the lymphatic drainage from the lower part of the body, it cannot happen. So the lymphatics in the lower part of the body, they keep on accumulating over there, resulting in what we call as lymphedema. And this results in a big swollen feet. Everything is normal, but one feet is really big. This is known as elephantiasis. And the organism is Wuchsia bancrofti. Is everyone clear about this? Yes or no? Okay, so with that being said, we are done with the nematodes of the body, all the nematodes. Okay, now, is the treatment high yield? Yes, the treatment is very high yield. We have not discussed about the treatment but we are done with discussing the parasite. Now we will discuss about the treatments. Okay, now. Okay. 
the, the treatments, what I need you to remember is that most of the nematodes are treated with, my, with Mercedes Benz, that is with Benz, with Bendazoles. Okay, with Benz means mebendazole, abendazole, right? Bendazoles are the most common treatment for most of the nematodes. Bendazoles, always bendazoles, except for the biter, the biters. For biters, for example, loa loa and wosheria, the treatment is diethylcarbamazine. And on Kosharka, the treatment is ivermectin. Ivermectin. And for these two, it's diethyl carbamazine. And for everything else, it's benz, it's bendazoles. It's not really, I uh, it's not really important that you have to remember ivermectin for strongyloidosis or parietal pamoate for ankylostoma because they they would still like to hear benz uh, bendazoles. Okay, mebendazoles, abendazoles, ibendazoles. These are the bendazoles. Okay. Bendazoles, uh, the, mechan the mechanism of action is actually pretty high yield. We'll discuss this when we study this, but what this does is this prevents uh, ion transportations in the uh, cytoplasmic membrane of um, the parasites and this causes parasitic paralysis. And as a result, the, they decrease, the, the mobility decreases and they die. So that's the me mechanism of action of bendazoles. We'll study that in details in the future, but for now, just try to remember the names. So everything except the biters. So you have ingested everything, up, all of these organisms can be treated with bendazoles, except these three, for which you have to prescribe Oncosharka and Wusheria, you have to prescribe diethylcarbamazine and for Loa Loa, you have to prescribe, I mean, for Loa Loa and Wusheria, you have to prescribe diethylcarbamazine and for Oncosharka, you have to prescribe ivermectin. That's all, okay? But then again, they don't really ask you about the treatment of these these three, they only ask you about these ones. Are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay. Okay, are we ready to begin the discussion on cystodes? Cystodes. Cystodes. Cystodes are very easy to understand, okay, because cystodes are very common. So I'm pretty sure you guys have learned or heard about this before, okay? The first cystode that I want to talk about, cystodes are tapeworms. The first cystode I want to talk about is teniasis. Teniasis is basically tenia solium, right? Tenia solium. Tenia solium is basically a tapeworm, okay? That And there are two ways that... Uh, this happens basically the tenia solium and all the cystodes, the mode of transmission of the parasites is fecal oral route, meaning that um, fecal oral or they could also be from ingestion of uncooked meat products. First, first of all, just, just give, me, give me one second, please. Give me one second. Please, sir. No. Okay. okay, my apologies. So tenia solium. Tenia solium is basically the mode of transmission is if either it's fecal oral or it's basically ingestion of uncooked meat products. Uncooked meat products, there are two meat products over here. That is uh, either it's uncooked uh, beef or uncooked pork, either one. Then the form is basically, you can get, the form is basically in the form of a larva or ingestion of eggs of tenia solium. What this does is once there is ingestion, these uh, parasites, they penetrate the intestinal wall and enter the bloodstream and they cause the, the diseases. Basically, um, what happens is uh, over here, uh, they have a tendency of, of going to the brain. Okay, the tenia, they have a tendency of going all the way to the brain 
and this is responsible for causing cystisarcosis, that is neurocystisarcosis. Responsible for causing neurocystisarcosis. Neurocystisarcosis, and that's all you have to remember for this one over here, for tinea solium. Okay, so ingestion of undercooked meat products, the penetration of, I mean, the presence of larvae and eggs in the meat, they, um, they mature in the intestine, penetrate the intestinal wall, enters the bloodstream, has a tendency of going to the brain and, and forming cysts over there known as neurocystisarcosis. That's that, okay? Next one. Next one is diphylobothrum latum. Diphylobothrum is the same process of this one, except the meat, the, the protein in concern is fish, meaning un, undercooked fish. If you have undercooked fish, that fish can have uh, larva, and, spe and sp specifically, the fish could be a freshwater fish. Okay, so that larva, what this will do is instead of go instead of going to the brain and causing neurocystisarcosis, like tinea, they stay in the intestine, and they hamper with uh, they hamper with um, B12 absorption. So they cause vitamin B12 deficiency. That's all you have to know. But Diphylobotum. They cause vitamin B12 deficiency, and as a result, patients can get what type of anemia can happen in these patients? Fast answers. What type of anemia can happen? Megaloblastic. Very good. Last one. Okay, last one. Last one is echinococcus granulosis. Echinococcus granulosis. This is this is the most highest yield one out of all three. Echinococcus granulosis is basically the mode of infection is fecal oral root once again. And um, it's basically having unhygienic food which has been contaminated with dog feces, okay? Dog feces. So basically if you have a pet dog in, in the house and if, if you do not uh, clean the dog nor do you clean your food, then there's a higher chance for these type of infection to happen. And what happens is when, when you uh, ingest the egg, they mature in the intestine and they travel to the liver. And in the liver, they cause a very important disease known as hydatid, known as hydatid cyst. They cause cysts in the liver. Don't confuse this one with liver abscess of entamoeba histolytica. Entamoeba histolytica will cause liver abscess anchovy sauce pus. This will cause hydrated cysts. Hydrated cysts look something like this. If this is the liver, this is the big cyst caused by echinococcus granulosis. And this cyst almost looks like an egg. I'm gonna tell you why this looks like an egg. Because the cyst, if you do a CT scan, you will see that the, that the cyst has the outer white appearance of calcification. This is known as eggshell calcification. Okay, this cyst, if you do not uh, perform the surgery and get and remove the cyst intact, always remember you have to remove the cyst intact. If you do not do that, if this cyst ruptures, then all the inflammatory mediators can get released in the blood and this can cause life threatening anaphylaxis. So, pe so people can die from anaphylactic shock. Okay, so that's that. Now, every one of the cystodes, all the cystodes, can be treated with a drug known as praziquinto. All the cysts can be treated with a drug known as praziquinto. Okay, are we clear? Except for echinococcus granulosis, which can be treated with praziquinto, but you can also give bendazoles, albendazoles, bevendazoles, these ones. Okay. So can you guys read this one now? And I'll ask you questions before I move on to trematodes. Okay, read this. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can leave behind. You have to read everything. The, these are the neurocystisarcosis type lesions, as you see in the, in the tinea. This is how a tinea tapeworm looks like. Okay, right? And this is the hydrated cyst of the liver showing that it's ruptured. This is the CT scan. How, notice how there's a white calcification around over here. Look at this white portion showing X-shell calcification of the liver. 
Okay. So that's all. That's that. Okay. Just read these. And I'll move forward to tremor tools. Okay. I'll give you guys two minutes. Okay, are we done reading about the systodes? Everyone? Okay. Done. Okay. So can we start with trematodes? Are we ready? Now, so uh, we'll just start talking about trematodes. Now we're done with nematodes, we're, we're done with cystodes. We'll start talking about trematodes. Trematodes. Trematodes are very easy to understand because it consists of a very high yield organism which we are all familiar with, okay? This organism is known as schistosoma. How many of us have heard schistosomiasis? Please say yes on the chat box if you have heard of it. Schistosoma hematobium, Schistosoma mansoni. Okay, very good. Schistosoma hematobium. Okay, what happens is um, <clears throat> over here you have two schistosoma. First of first one is Schistosoma hematobium. Okay, hematobium. This has always remember this Schistosoma hematobium. They have a terminal spine. Okay, Schistosoma hematobium they have a terminal spine. And schistosoma mansoni, they have a lateral spine. Okay, so this is man, schistosoma mansoni, this is heme, hematobium. This is how you, you can distinguish two schistosoma. One has a terminal spine, another one has a lateral spine. They can cause um, the host over here, the snails are the intermediate host, meaning that um, the snails are the ones who will carry the organism and the, and, um, the um, infecting form, the form at which it will infect you, that form is known as a, that form is known as a sarsari, okay? Not that high yield, you don't have to worry about this. But what happens is that they are present, especially in fresh water. So when you go for swimming or bathing, these uh, schistosoma, they can enter via the, uh, via the um, this can enter the bladder, right? When it enters the bladder, especially the schistosoma hematobium, this will cause transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. This can cause transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. And they can also travel to the lungs and cause pulmonary hypertension. That is for schistosoma hematobium. Okay, next one. Another one is for schistosoma mansoni. Schistosoma mansoni, what they will do is they will go to the liver and they, they can cause portal hypertension and 
hepatic fibrosis. So schistosomal myxonia can cause portal hypertension and hepatic fibrosis, and this will cause transitional cell carcinoma and pulmonary hypertension. That's all you need to know from over here. The treatment is for schistosoma, you have to give praziquantel. You have to give praziquantel the same that you prescribe for systems. That's that. Okay, is everyone clear about this? Yes, okay, good. Okay, uh, I apologize, I just need five minutes. So is it possible for you guys to take a five minute break and then we can come back? Okay, just give me five minutes.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. Okay, so uh, I want to revise the discussion on schistosomiasis. Okay, so before uh, I begin, I'll uh, talk about how what schistosomiasis is once again. It's a very common parasite, which we all know. There are two types, hematobium and mansoni. Hematobium has a terminal spine. Mansoni has a lateral spine, okay? Um, basically what happens is you have, um, these are very prevalent in fresh water and when people, they go, they go uh, swimming, this parasites, they have a tendency of entering the bladder, especially uh, schistosoma hem hem hematobium is the one, not mansoni, because mansoni will go and cause hepatic fibrosis and portal hypertension, but schistosoma hematobium will enter the bladder via the urethral passage and when they enter the bladder, they will stay over there, cause damage and cause squamous cell carcinoma. My apologies, not transitional cell carcinoma. Transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder is more prevalent in smokers because of the presence of nitrogenous compound in cigarettes. So that's that, but squamous cell carcinoma is what happens in schistosoma hematobium. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, and they also have a tendency of going to the lungs and causing port, uh, pulmonary hypertension. That's that. And schistosoma mansoni will go to the liver, cause hepatic fibrosis and portal hypertension. Once again, the host is the snails. They are the intermediary host and um, they are the one who harbors the parasite in the water. And when people, they go swimming in fresh water, they get affected with schistosomiasis. The treatment is praziquanto. The treatment is praziquanto. Okay, um, are we clear about schistosomes about schistosomiasis? Yes or no? Okay, next one. Next one is Clonorchis, Clonorchis sinensis, Clonorchis sinensis. Clonorchis sinensis, first of all, which parasite did we talk about in the past that was present in undercooked fish? Past answers. Which parasite was present in undercooked fish? D. latum for diphylobothrum. Diphylobothrum latum. This one, this parasite, this is also, this is also present in undercooked fish. Okay, this is also present in undercooked fish. And what happens is this parasite, basically what they will do is this is, this is the only parasite that can cause cholangio carcinoma, meaning that they will go and they will deposit in the gallbladder. Okay, they will induce the formation of pigmented gallstone because they will cause inflammation of the, of the gallbladder and long-term inflammation of the gallbladder can result in the formation from chronic of chronic inflammation to acute inflammation. And we all know what happens if chronic inflammation is not uh, stopped because there is a possibility that there could either be fibrosis or they could either be carcinoma. So that's exactly what happens. So long-term staying of clonorchis, especially in the gallbladder, okay? Especially in the gallbladder, this causes inflammation resulting in gallstones or chronic inflammation can lead to cholangiocarcinoma. Okay, the treatment for this one is also praziquanto. Okay, so basically the treatments, we can give bendazoles for all nematodes and for cystodes and trematodes, we can give, for cystodes and trematodes, we can give praziquanto. Are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay, all right. Now, that's that. Okay, let's go over here. Okay. We are done with trematodes. That is schistosoma. This one called liver and spleen enlargement. Schistosoma mansoni. This has a lateral spine. This will cause hepatic fibrosis and portal hypertension. And hematobium has a terminal spine. This can lead to square muscle carcinoma of the bladder and pulmonary hypertension. Snails are the intermediary host. 
infecting form is a sarsari. And uh, the infection happens when humans come in close contact with contaminated fresh water. The treatment is with praziquantel. Clonorchis sinensis is um, another one which is spread by having undercooked fish like that from the water bladder. This causes chronic inflammation of the gallbladder and untreated chronic inflammation for a long time can result in cholangiocarcinoma and they can induce the formation of pigmented gallstones. That's that. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Now, next one. How many of us are familiar with, how many of us are familiar with scabies? Sarcoptes, scaby, hominis. Sarcopte, scaby, hominis. How many of us are familiar with the disease that is scabies? Yes, scabies. Scabies, do they happen in clean places or do they happen to people who lives in mass amount and uh, in close contact? Mass and close contact. Is it, is it highly contagious or not contagious at all? If you treat a scabies patient, are you, are you supposed to have scabies too? Okay. Okay. So Sarcoptus scaby hominis is an ectoparasite. It's not a nematode, cystode, trematode, nor is it a protozoa. It's an ectoparasite. Do you know what the word ectoparasite means? Ectoparasite means parasites which harvests outside the human body. They do not need to survive in the blood. They can survive outside the human body. That's why this, these are known as ectoparasites. Cystodes, nematodes, trematodes, protozoa, those are endoparasites, okay? So what happens is over here, um, the spread of infection is, is contact to contact. So contact infection, okay? Spread of infection is contact. And what happens is over here, Sarcoptis scaby hominis is basically a parasite, which when it comes in contact with your skin, let's say you the most common source of infection is from, uh, from being in close contact to an, to an affected individual. And when the parasite comes in close contact to your skin, the parasite has the audacity to penetrate your skin, okay? To penetrate your skin, lay an egg over there, and, and then it will die. When I, I, I remember trying to describe this to my wife. She got so grossed out, she almost passed out from this, okay? But um, that's exactly what happens. So what happens is when you come in close contact to an affected individual, the parasite enters your skin, lays an egg, and then it dies. So what happens is this egg releases more parasite and this parasite roams around in your body all the way up to your hands, to your skin, legs, and then you start scratching that entire place. And it's just a very horrible and um, uh, to be honest, a very... Um, it's a very sad condition for a patient. The reason being is when the patient uh, goes to bed at night, that's when uh, the threshold level for itching and pain, right, they decrease. So itchiness, if it's one time in the morning, it's 10 times at night, meaning that at, at night time, the patient cannot sleep because the itching is actually 10 times worse, okay, at night. So. This is very common in crowded population. For example, uh, in uh, for example in uh, homeless shelters, then jails, nursing homes, um, daycare centers, and children. That's 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 one. And um, what happens is over here, the treatment is also very high yield. The treatment is okay. You have first of all, you have to wash and get rid of all the clothes which you were wearing when you were affected by scabies. And then you can prescribe the patient a cream known as, known as parmethrin. Parmethrin, parmethrin cream. You can also prescribe ivermectin. Okay, but that's, that's that. Was I, was I successful in painting a picture of scabies, how it enters, lays in eggs, dies, 
eggs mature, roams around in your body, you start scratching your body, and, at, and in the night it's 10 times worse. Did I succeed in painting a proper picture? Yes or no? Use the chat box, please. Get some feedback. Do I have all my students over here? Yes or no? Or did you guys leave? Okay. Okay, perfect. Did you understand scabies? Okay. Um, scabies. First of, first of all, all of these organisms, you might be wondering how the questions are going to come. Questions are going to come from over here. Answers are usually the names of the organisms for at least parasite. They try to keep it simple. Names, they wanna know the names, which parasite, which name, for example, muscle inflammation after fecal oral contamination, what is the name? Trichinella spiralis. So names are high yield. Questions are going to come from the presentations. Okay, next one. Next one is pediculus humanus or teres or ty or tyrus pubis. How many of us have heard of uh, head louse or lice? Have we heard of lice? Yes or not? No. Okay. Okay. Lice. Lice are basically once again lice. They're ectoparasites. Always remember ectoparasites. The transmission is from contact to contact. So. Coming in contact with a close affected individual is the cause of the infection. Okay, what happens is the lice or pediculus humanus, it causes, um, it has a tendency of, uh, of being either in your scalp, okay, which can cause head lice, right? Head lice. Mm -hmm. It has the tendency of being in body creases. So axilla is a crease. This can cause body lice and pubic or perianal creases. Perianal, perianal or perianal, perianal creases. Okay, so the lice they stay over there, and when they stay over there, what they try to do is they 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 try to burrow. This is the word you're looking for. They try to burrow in your skin, meaning that they try to enter your skin, but they can. They try to get inside the skin by going through the scalp, axilla, pubic, and this causes intense pruritus, extreme pruritus. So people will always be scratching their head and itching their head or itching their pubic area or penny and all area all the time, okay? This can cause extreme pruritus. Um, the thing is over here, the lice, they cause, uh, they, they, they cause the damage. Just give me one second, please. Okay. So where were we now? Uh, my apologies. Okay. No. So body lice and uh, head lice or pubic lice. Okay. Not only will they will they burrow into the skin and cause the disease. Okay, they all they also they're also responsible for harvesting and um, carrying certain organisms. Okay, the organisms that they carry is rickettsia. Then they can also carry Borrelia. They can also carry Bartonella, and these are the three ones. So they can carry rickettsia, Prawazeki. They can cause. They can they can carry Borrelia recurrentis. 
and they also carry Bartonella, Bartonella quintana. Okay, not high yield. These are not high yield, so don't worry about this. You will not get any questions about uh, these things. Over here, except the fact, just try to remember. If you have to remember one thing, try to remember Rickettsia palosecchi because this they will cause epidemic typhus. So once again, the body louse will cause the pruritus, and at the same time, if they are carrying any one of these three organisms, they can cause the respective infections. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Okay, treatment-wise, once again, treatment is, once again, the same thing, parmethrin, cream, then ivermectin, ivermectin, and we can also give another one, that is known as malathion. Malathion. Okay. Are we clear? Are we clear, guys? Okay. So pediculus humanus or or or. or Tyrus pubis is a blood sucking louse that can cause intense pruritus. They try to burrow, that's why they suck the blood. With associated excoriation, common in scalp and neck, pubic region, waistband, and axilla. They harvest or they contain Rickettsia prowazeki, Borrelia, and Bartonella. Okay, over here, this one is more high yield, Rickettsia prowazeki. Treatment wise, you can give them Malathion, Ivermectin, Parmethrin lotions, and or Another one is pyrethroids, pyrethroids, okay? But you don't have to remember pyrethroids, just remember ivermectin, that's enough. Ivermectin and permethrin cream, that's, all, that's, that's enough. Children with head lice can be treated at home without interrupting school attendance. This is an ethical question. This is a question from medical ethics, okay? That if you are a doctor who, has, who is treating a child with head loss, are you going to ask the parents to prevent the children from going to the school? The answer is no. Because you can start treating them. This is there's this is no reason. This is not so contaminating that uh, children can spread the disease. Once the treatment starts, the infection will subside and the children can uh, go to school independently. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay, now. Let me do a fast revision and recapitulation. First of all, can you guys name the disease that can cause perianal, perianal pruritus? Which organisms cause perianal pruritus? Fast answers, please. Let me see how much the head has been working for all of us. And is very good, very proud of you guys. Next one is which organism can cause uh, striated muscle inflammation, muscle inflammation? Spirals, very good. Trichinella spiralis, very good. Which one can go and cause cyst in the brain? Cyst in the brain. Very good. Tinea, tinea solium. Okay, which, which one can go and cause cholangiocarcinoma? You guys remember we talked about this right now, cholangiocarcinoma. Sinensis, very good. Clonorchis, sinensis undercooked fish, okay. Which parasite can cause squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder? Squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, good, very good. Schistosoma hematobium. Which organism can cause liver abscess? Liver abscess. Liver abscess. And amoeba histolytica. Echinococcus granulosus will not cause liver abscess. The answer is Entamoeba histolytica. Which organism, okay, which organism can cause foul smelling fatty stool? Foul smelling fatty stool. Very good. Which organism can cause diarrhea in AIDS? Diarrhea in AIDS. Which organism can cause African sleeping sickness? Bruce Lee for Brucey. Which organism can cause dilated cardiomyopathy, mega esophagus, mega colon, crudzy? Okay, 
cruelty. Very good. Okay, which organism can penetrate your skin from contaminated soil? Contaminated soil. Stronguloids, very good. Okay, which organism, when they uh, penetrate your skin and contaminate, they can cause ileocecal valve obstruction by hampering with Okay, which organism can cause greenish vaginal discharge? Okay, which organism can cause parasites in the eye that moves? Parasites in the eyes that move, that move, worm in the eye, lower wall. Which one can cause blindness? Which one can cause blindness? Okay, which one can cause elephantiasis? Okay, which one can cause rectal prolapse? Whipworm, very good. Cratchuris, cratchura. Okay, next one. Which one can cause hydrated cysts in the liver? Echinococcus, very good. Which one can cause vitamin B12 deficiency? Okay, which one can cause, which type of kiss? Schistosoma can cause um, liver fibrosis and portal hypertension. Manson, very good. Okay, last question. Which one can cause multiple ring enhancing lesions in the brain? Okay. So we are done with parasites. These are some hints that you can use for revision. Okay. Okay, so how do you guys feel? Do you guys feel confident about the parasites? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, that's great news. Amazing, thank you so much for putting your attention to the lecture, okay. So uh, with that being said, um, is it okay if I end the lecture over here for today? Because to be honest, I had to go to the hospital in the morning and I have to report back. Okay, this is uh, my apologies because today has been a very busy day for me out of nowhere. Uh, we have had some, some emergencies and um, okay. How is your father? Thank you so much for asking. My father is doing absolutely wonderful. He came back home after the laryngectomy. He had, um, he has uh, an HME and um, he can speak now. He started speaking again recently uh, with the help of the valve. And um, yes, so that's been very good. And uh, Alhamdulillah is doing pretty well right now. So thank you so much everyone for keeping him in your prayers. Uh, this was a very difficult time, to be honest, for the last one month, but things are looking pretty good right now. So that's that. Okay. Uh, he had to learn how to speak again. So um, that was new for him, but he was doing well. You mean he was not verbal till now all this time? Yes, he was not verbal because he had um, stage, he had stage two laryngeal carcinoma, which was T2N0M0. And uh, he had a laryngectomy following um, following uh, procedure, which would allow him to speak with the help of a valve. So that's what he's, that's what he has been doing for the last one month. So thank you so much for your prayers once again. And uh, nope, nothing to be sorry about. He's doing good. Thank you so much for your prayers, Dr. Naoud and everyone else. Thank you so much. Hope you guys have a Okay, hey, hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much. We are done with parasitology. We will try to um, we will try to start the lecture tomorrow early morning at 9 a.m. since tomorrow is a Friday. Um, okay.
9 a.m. And we will try to make sure that we finish virology in one day so that from next week, we can start with um, the drugs. We can start with antibiotics, which is extremely high yield. But in the meantime, we will be done with microbiology. This will allow you to do the questions from you world. Okay. So tomorrow, I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. And uh, we'll start from there. Okay. Hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much. Uh, the reason why we're not doing questions this week is because we want to make sure that we give you enough time to rest and review and learn and memorize first aid. Okay. So that's why we are not doing questions, but we will be doing questions full blown from next week, especially micro questions, which we will be doing if, uh, from next week, especially from you world offline. That's what we will be doing. And I have personally prepared a lot of questions. So from next week, we will be doing 10 questions every day because we have to make up for the five questions which we did not do. Once again, to provide time for you to study. So please utilize this time properly, uh, take rest and try to cover microbiology as much as possible because the information is still very new and fresh in your mind. So if you want to memorize something, this is the best time. And at the same time, if there is any organism which does not, which is which is hampering you or which you find difficult, you can always use your free physio subscription to um, watch the video on the organism and solidify your information. Just let us know that you're using the physio so that uh, it doesn't get canceled. Okay. So hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. Let me know if there's any questions. Send us an email. And thank you so much.